three members of the College of Architecture and Planning who will be making presentations. I have the pleasure of introducing the first of these three this evening. Our first speaker is Omar Farouk, who is Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture. Omar and his lovely bride, who joined in the summer, are both natives of Bangladesh. Omar has been teaching with us here for a number of years, and his areas of specialization are design and graphics. Omar has a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture degree from Texas A&M, and also a Master of Architecture degree from the same institution. He is a member of both the AIA and the ASLA. He is a registered architect in Texas. He is a registered landscape architect in Texas and Louisiana. So his credentials really are equally shared uh, between the two professions. His topic tonight is entitled Space, Graphics, and Design. Omar? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we are already late by uh, five minutes. I told uh, uh, Dean that uh, I would take that five minutes with interest. That means I may go over what is time. Uh, we, uh, I'm supposed to spend about 30 minutes. Uh, I will try to uh, finish it in 30 minutes, and uh, if I do go over the minute, please bear with, uh, bear with me, because it only more than five or six minutes over my uh, 30 minutes. Uh, can I get the uh, lights off? Uh, at the beginning, uh, I would like to recite some things to you, uh, see whether you can understand the meaning. Uh, please give uh, close attention to what I am pronouncing. Shāpenastam dhamita mahimā vashyo bhoganum bhat Yākṣa chakre janakatamaya snāna kunnata gashu Snikho chāya tarashu vāsati rāmo giriyāsra mashu Did you understand anything? No. These are the uh, beginning lines of Meghaguta. Meghaguta is an epic poem written in Sanskrit by Kalidasa. Kalidasa is considered as one of the greatest Indian poets of all time. Now, the reason I recite these lines tonight are twofold. Firstly, there is something to be, or needed to be said about Sanskrit language itself and this particular type of composition that I have recited. This has a special significance with regard to communication in general and particularly with regard to communication media uh, uh, and their impact upon the message and the, more importantly for us, art form. Secondly, Kalidas wrote many epic poems. I have chosen Mehuduta. I have chosen Mehuduta because it has a special significance with regard a special significance to the designers of space. Why so? Because this particular epic poem makes an elaborate and extensive and meticulously detailed uh, description of varieties of space. Now, when this uh, I would also like to uh, point out that Kalidasa, uh, it is a, uh, as 
documented that he lived in uh, uh, four, uh, between 4th and 5th AD. Now, when these ancient poets sat down to write one of these epics, they had this in mind, that this, these poems will be recited before an audience. Consequently, they have taken special care in selecting the words and also about their placement so that the sound quality which is created by these words themselves or the self can set the mood of the space and the places of the story. In doing this, these poets manipulated the words and the sequence of them. Now, this kind of manipulation is possible in Sanskrit language because this grammar allows that. As for example, to repeat the lines I have said, Kashji Kanta Viraha Guruna Swabhi now, if we want to trans translate that word for word, it will be something like this in English. A certain, on account of lover separation heavy, having failed in his duty, curse deprived of glory to be endured for a year of his Lord. Yaksha, in the Janaka's daughter, ablution, purified water, take shade, tree, dwelling, Rama mountain, hermitage. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense in English, but if you know Sanskrit, you can make out the meaning very well. It means, I on the mountain of Rama, a Yaksha dwelt, who, for neglect of duty, had lost his great estate, sentenced by his law to a year of exile. Grievous with separation from his dear wife, he stayed in hermit groves of gentle shade trees and waters hallowed by the baths of Janaka's child. So, when these Sanskrit poems are recited with appropriate pronunciation to those who of course know the Sanskrit, the audience not only understand the meaning, but the mood and the uh, atmosphere is set by the sound quality of the words. Now, Medhubhuta means uh, the cloud messenger. The story of this poem is about Yaksha's separation, uh, his separation from his wife uh, for a year and his attempt to communicate to his wife uh, by sending the cloud as the messenger. This is only the story, the, the background story, but the main focus of this epic poem, for which it is so special, uh, is the, uh, the uh, is not Yaksha, not Cloud, nor his wife, but the detailed description of variety of landscape. In this sense, the poet plays the role of a designer of a space with a fantastic picture fluency, and that is something that picture fluency I'll be talking this evening later on. So, as for example, I have tried to depict uh, the, uh, the few, first few lines of this epic poem with pictures and see how it goes. Yash 
this vertical dimension is also creating the interest because by increasing it. So if this picture again has any merit, it is the space which has which which gives the uh, merit to this picture. The same thing is true about although you have see the land form, but the water introduction and so forth uh, is giving the structure, and that's what making the space. Same thing is true about uh, about this here, where these trees in the foreground and the the uh, the land form at the background, and this is serving in structuring the space, and that's what is making the picture. There is nothing really ex uh, extraordinary or magical about the about this. Uh, a drawing uh, except the space and it's the design. In that sense, drawing is inseparable from design. Uh, regardless how small it is, still it is the space, the vertical elements. It is we talk about contrast and so forth which make the picture. But this contrast to give the volume of the space. Uh, or even a tiny space, a space. There, are, you know, you're talking about if you compare these two, two drawings, the depth which is created here is giving little more interest to the picture on the right than the other, the, the, than on the left. The, if you look at Kant's design, uh, Louis Kant's design of the second capital in Dhaka, which is uh, about ten miles away from my hometown, uh, the what he is, what he has done is only dealt with very simple forms, round and uh, uh, and rectangular forms. But what makes this his design as well as this picture interesting is the manipulation of the space. How the space in the background is connected with the space here, and of course how the walls are creating the space there, uh, creating the spaces. And uh, many a times students come to me and say, "Well, um, you know, I have the design of the space, but I just don't." Not how to draw it, you know, as if the drawing is something some expertise somewhere else has come to know. Uh, if you have the design, you should be able to draw. It's that simple. Because uh, if you if your space is meritorious, the drawing is going to be fun to. So now I'm going to show you some examples of uh, how I, uh, uh, in my professional work, try to use this three dimensional of drawings. In to put to use for arriving at that solution. Uh, a project uh, like this, uh, this is a waste water treatment plant which is something we can actually try to improve, improve the environment and quality of it. But at the outset, I started with, okay, what is, what is the, what's the type of feeling I want to see in it? What's the type of feeling I want to see in it? And uh, uh, they uh, and start, started there. What kind of color are we expecting? What are the? What, do we want a vertical dimension? Uh, we want kind of space. Now that this does not mean that we are not we are not dealing with the rational aspect of the design. Yes, we are dealing with the rational aspect. But this is this is as important as the rational aspect. Because that's what is going to make it into a into an art form. Uh, the same thing is true. Incidentally, this is a project done by LPW. Uh, I was working with them at that time. Uh, of the same project and studying what happens if you uh, put a group of three, how you divide the space, how you create the series of the space, and does it create interest in it? Uh, uh, the picture is not really that exciting, but it still, it still looks because how the space at the background and this backdrop relates to the space there and there, and how this, this, this relationship is done, achieved, and that's what merit of this sketch. Uh, same thing, how the space up there, the bottlenecks in the spaces and the space over here, how they are emphasizing each other. Uh, or example like this, uh, how the edge up there created, this is the waterfront of the project I did in, uh, uh, in Texas. But the thing we said, what kind of edge, how, what kind of end framing we are talking about? We have designed the buildings at that, we're just looking at the, looking at the what sort of environment to this kind of uh, Two-dimensional studies. Even the studies done, um, even at the very preliminary stage, where we are even counting the numbers. This is a residential. We are talking about the roof lines, how they will enclose the space. Uh, or, or, or the result of it. Plan is not, uh, plan is important, but that's that's a very very uh, 
that is far removed from our experiential world. Uh, but here you can see the bottleneck and so forth. And this is the spatial considerations of the relationship between the space there, 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 there. This, this is the sequence of what's making the design or a project like this in Harper's history. Um, yeah, how I, I have very big consideration in terms of how to create a series of spaces. The building will become uh, the articulator of a structured space, which the space makes, makes this uh, makes this drawing. It's not the picture, the picture of drawing. The picture, the reason the picture looks nice because the spaces are articulated well. Or even uh, if I am studying uh, at very uh, two dimensional, still I'm uh, talking about. Uh, space. Uh, incidentally, it has done charcoal and marker. Uh, well, I will talk about media later. Uh, uh, this is, has nothing to do with the previous project, but this is a classroom demonstration. I was uh, in a design studio. I was showing students how to study by two, three minute time and five and thumbnail the sketches, see feelings, what they want to capture. Uh, if you notice that the building there, I mean, you know, they're so crude, it looks like they're beaten up buildings. But still, it's, it's, you, can, you can see the essence of the space, and that's what what we were dealing with. The decisions of the building, and they, they can be decided later. But the vertical, the vertical elements, the horizontal elements, and how they are structured in the space, that's what makes this uh, sketch exciting. If you feel this feeling of the capture when you have the design, uh, they don't take much time. They, they, they can be done very fast, very quick. Uh, the, the reason they have to, have to be done first, fast, because at a given moment in our brain, we can only visualize our brain is very fast. And sometimes when I start drawing, I, my pen jumps, I, I jumps away from my hand. They don't have to be captured as quick as possible. Um, you see the space in, uh, here as opposed to this one where the space at the background and this bottleneck, how this is connected. Uh, these are called spatial windows. You, know, the, you have these windows are very, very interesting because they establish a very, very interesting relationship between the spaces. Where uh, all this, the space like this, which is kind of linear uh, and also have the vertical dimension. Uh, without verticality, it's hard to really structure the space. Uh, okay, now. I will show you an example of uh, with this kind of study of the real example of a project which I had the opportunity to, dis to do the land planning as well as the unit design of 60 units of uh, uh, townhomes in uh, 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 between Fort Worth and Texas. Uh, it's about 40 miles away from Fort Worth. Uh, and uh, you uh, notice the spatial quality I try to capture in this uh, and has the same kind of same kind of uh, open spaces I have been talking in the previous sketches. Uh, notice the roof lines. I try to build it. You know, roof lines and uh, the, uh, this is a result of that kind of study. You know how one space leads to another. Or you know, bottom making a small space, large, medium space, and or the you know, it's the larger space, the bottom neck up there, and, and another bottom over, over here, and uh, the relationship. See what happens whenever you have a sketch. Your eye ought to look through and quickly try to find the center of interest. Experiencing, I don't, I could not find at the moment uh, at that time to word, put a word of the experiment or getting involved, experiencing. Uh, this is something which I do very frequently whenever I am going somewhere or go there, uh, uh, or if, if I happen to be in a space which I really get excited and I, I, I like it. Uh, one thing to understand is already built, already built spaces is to do some very quick sketches of them. And that's what I did as a habit. That, that, gives an, that gives an insight, the development insight, which is very, very useful for uh, studies in other projects. Uh, about a couple of years ago, I had opportunity to uh, uh, go to a uh, handbook uh, on workshop, and there um, I had one afternoon, had some time, and uh, you know, play with 
there because we can't really capture the key phase. Uh, what kind of line is there? What kind of group line? What kind of volume? What kind of shape and form? Or what, see whether whatever attempted by a site planner or an architect or a landscape architect is it really doing the job or not. When you start drawing it, then you begin to see it. Those, uh, those of you who had the opportunity to go to Cran to visit the marvelous, uh, marvelous uh, academy, little Cran to art, art academy, and uh, you probably also have noticed a sculpture like this in the uh, of the Crane Group House, uh, which is drawn from looking at this, uh, from the school across the water body. Uh, what is the composition which is already there? Medium. Uh, I will go through several slides showing the various media which can be done, uh, studied. Uh, of course, black and white and this kind of, uh, black and white. Uh, incidentally, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a sketch problem given to me by the uh, 4K students uh, a couple of years ago because uh, I was giving them once in a while sketch problems and they got tired of it and said, well, you wait there, we'll give you a sketch problem. So they gave me a sketch problem and gave me 12 hours that I could produce a bunch of drawings and so forth. And gave me a program and a site and so forth and uh, I enjoyed the uh, involvement, but don't, don't get the idea and give uh, all the props there. the sketch problems. Um, the, uh, there are some uh, very good media you can reproduce them very easily. This is done with pen pen and pen, uh, pencil uh, and uh, markers. And of course charcoal. Charcoal is fantastic to study the space. Uh, they're very soft and you know, good portrait is nothing but a very good study of space. And if it has a very good study of space, you get a volume of support that uh, uh, volume of space, and if the space is a structure, well, how can this work? Or you can use just simple black uh, and uh, uh, black line, or just simply this, uh, then there are stick on black paper, but uh, that's what I mean. Uh, or you can use chalkboard, that's it. It's fantastic media because you can erase it. Any video mistake is erasing. It's, it's, it's cheap. Uh, and uh, um, it, it's, it's, and you, uh, with this day and time, and you can buy a film and record it. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, uh, this is a project where I presented the entire project in chalkboard. Uh, Uh, you can also buy colored chalks, and they're 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 very uh, useful, and they can be very uh, they can be very handy for conceptual studies. And of course, if you let a machine to draw, that's what happens. Okay, let's see. Okay, this this is. Uh, You don't have to have the, all the details worked out. Still, you can you can really study the space and uh, uh, show how the relationship can be done. Uh, this is done at the time, same time when this conceptual study is being made. Uh, this is also uh, a classroom demonstration showing the interior space. How you can really use the very fast, quick media done with this one is done with uh, travel tape pen and markers and also prismacolor pencils. Study. Uh, also, with a classroom demonstration, I have shown how, with the design projects, or how they can be, uh, this media can be used to study the space. And you can see how the space, space up there, ready here, there, here, and how your eyes keep moving and slowly want to see things there. 
you're going to have to have all the technology and everything worked out. It's still even it's just a stroke of marker can show. But what is important, more important, that's something which I'm also getting concerned of the future, that we might get bogged in the technology so much that we fail to, uh, fail to study the consequence or the perceptual consequence of the space. Uh, that's what uh, the study is all about. Or if it is watercolor, this is not a design study, but this is a watercolor painting which, uh, uh, but watercolor media takes a little longer time unless you are proficient in it. Again, another watercolor painting. Uh, this is something like this, so you can do very fast if you're proficient in about 15 minutes, 30 minutes maximum. Uh, but uh, those, I mean, you know, you want to spend more, more than five, five, ten minutes for a session studying the design. And that's all I have to say this evening, and I hope I have not taken too much time. Thank you very much.
attempts were made to incorporate West Germany into the Eastern part. Uh, indeed, the airlift of 1949 helped to uh, maintain West Berlin as part of the Western world. East Berlin, the capital of East Germany, with just about 1.7 million, as the capital of 17 million strong, a 70 million strong country, is probably the wealthiest and in many respects the most progressive communist country. Very active in also rebuilding this part of the much destroyed city, destroyed during the last war. East Berlin probably was slower, much slower in rebuilding uh, and in reshaping. However, it was quite successful in reshaping downtown. It became really something like a prototype of a communist city with a red square. Downtown dominated by a huge TV tower. We have much rebuilding, restoration of uh, historic buildings because the actual city, the core of the city, of the historical city, is now part of East Berlin. The final separation of these two cities occurred in 1971 when a wall was built, a wall which kept people from East Germany, from East Berlin, from merging, from moving over to West Berlin, from indeed seeking a better environment, a better political, a better economic environment. Because of this war, Berlin, West Berlin, indeed, is really something like an island with a very specific atmosphere. During the recent years, visits are possible. People from West Berlin, from West Germany, Foreigners, Americans can go over and see the city. However, people from the other side are not permitted to come over unless under very special circumstances. Officially, West Berlin is still the seat of the government of the Federal Republic, but only in an idealistic sense because, for all practical purposes, Bonn is the provisional, so called provisional capital of the Federal Republic. Still maintained is the palace of the President of the Federal Republic, also the Reichstag, the Parliament building, destroyed through the war, is rebuilt and uh, serves other purposes such as exhibits, uh, cultural uh, events, and also on occasion certain committee meetings of the West German Parliament. Because of its location, West Berlin needs economic support and receives economic support in terms of tax incentives, uh, other incentives, subsidies, in order to still flourish economically. Traditionally, it uh, has a number of clean industries, particularly electronics, chemicals, garment industries, and a number of uh, various other ranges. Because of its location, and maybe typically for many cities, the population is stagnating. The economic growth is small. In order to maintain the viability of the city, special emphasis is placed on scientific aspects. It became the center of research, cultural aspects, of art, literature, education. It is one of the largest congress cities of the world. The center of West Berlin to the right, the Kurfürsten Damm to the left, symbol of uh, the division of the city, the gate, which is essentially between the old part and the new part, and now between east and west. Geographically, we see on the left the whole city as it grew concentrically and uh, emerged from various smaller cities 
around the original cost. What you see quite clearly is a division in the middle indicated by a red line, East Berlin to the right, West Berlin to the left. We can honor this uh, difficult uh, problem. In general, we can say one thing which helps to make life in West Berlin particular is an island pleasant is its large extent of uh, water. More than 8% of the whole area is water. 40% as we can see more clearly in a map designating the various uses, usages of uh, West Berlin. Green areas, of course, are forests, large forests, which make recreation uh, possible within the constraints of a large city. Dimensions, we have about a relatively large area, 30 by 20 miles in each direction. Part of the symbolism of the destruction of the city is expressed in an old church, the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, maintained as a symbol of destruction, intent to maintain peace. Contrasted with a new structure by Egon Bayermann, one of the quiet islands within the city. Berlin is a city of monuments. See one here, one from the end of the last century, a victory column. Contrasts old buildings, such here as the late 19th century uh, museum building. And again, the downtown of West Berlin. Contrasts, a mixture of housing, commercial facilities, the downtown areas, the build-up areas, interspersed by large parks. The intercity park to the right, which takes advantage of uh, natural uh, features, which are indeed very similar to what we know from Wisconsin. An area really dominated by the impressions of the ice age. Recent multi-use facilities, such as the building to the left, commercial space below, housing on top, housing interspersed with remainders of the rural past of the city, which is maintained. Urban renewal, consolidation of downtown areas, as you know it from the late 60s and 70s, Contrasted by other remainders of the past, the pavilion of the mid 19th century, now one of the many museums. Within the Grunewald, the large, largest forest area of the city, we have the Renaissance Castle, one of the nice retreats, also a museum which also offers concerts. I was mentioning the large expenses of water, large bodies of water. One of the favorite pastimes is indeed the enjoyment of the water for uh, steamboat, right, sailing, swimming, and simply other types of pleasure. One of the largest remains of the past is the Castle Charlottenburg, which uh, was one of the summer residences. Now, after a careful restoration, after war damage, featuring historical uh, rooms and large galleries. Downtown 
shopping is expanded, one of the features we find increasingly are galleries, such as this particular one here. When you look at the city, it's full of monuments of the past and the recent past, the present. History of modern architecture, we find Paul Behrens, IAG, Turbine, Hall, Factory, and indeed a very strong documentation of the development of modern architecture. I was mentioning the Summer Institute, an effort to and intent to work with an international building exhibit an organization which was founded to promote new ideas about uh, current architectural developments and building. Four were held in the past. One was held in 1911, uh, devoted to urban growth. In 1931, we had one which was essentially devoted to housing. And examples of that particular exhibit were buildings of the late 20s, such as a horseshoe uh, development, the typical Siedlungen of the late 20s and early 30s. There are architects such as Taut and others. These developments are attractive here. During the springtime, we have cherry blossoms. Uh, where people still come to these old uh, developments, They're still extremely vital, well kept, and functional. At the same time as uh, these developments I have shown you, which are part of this effort to formulate a new type of architecture uh, with the outgrowth of, outgrowth of other developments such as Mendelssohn's more expressionistic buildings, combinations of uh, housing and uh, commercial development to the left, office building to the right. Examples of the 30s, a big jump, building after the war, uh, variety I mentioned, the intent to make or to maintain West Berlin particularly as a center of cultural events, museum designed by Louis Vendero. Uh, example of the expressionistic buildings after yeah, World War II. Example, we are saying is the Philomenic Hall by Hans Scharud. Rich expressions of space. Examples of this particular vernacular uh, seen in many parts of the city. Part of this particular complex uh, of the Philharmonic Hall is close to the old parliament building which had been restored, a uh, place of exhibits and other events. Berlin is a city of uh, congresses, examples of recent facilities, more flexible buildings, parts of a University. A look across the wall, the old 50s style, Schubebaker style housing, uh, typical for the Stalin area in East Berlin. If you went to downtown from West Berlin across the wall, then we see the dominating feature the TV tower, the old city hall, and prefabricated. Housing, one of the most recent, more advanced examples of Eastern German planning. I mentioned the series again of building exhibits, international building exhibits, 
After the 1931 exhibit, we had one in 1957, essentially devoted to the redevelopment of the destroyed city. I'm essentially showing you an overview, a large number of buildings designed by architects from 14 different countries, demonstrating uh, new developments for that time, including one unité d'habitation by Le Corbusier, which also was part of this particular international building exhibit. Essentially, the principles which were put forward and demonstrated in 57 dominated, I guess, our building and rebuilding efforts of the past war area. Now we are indeed in a period of reformulation, uh, attempts to make the city more human, to develop new senses of living together. The major focus, the major intent of the new international building exhibit under planning now uh, and to be culminated in a large string of events and demonstration buildings in 1984 is devoted to redefinition of housing in downtown, downtown housing in inner areas to make them manageable, uh, to refine indeed the city block as a building block within the fabric of the city. Several demonstration areas are designated in Berlin, in West Berlin, and attempts are made to utilize the existing fabric, the city block, to create new prototypes of inter-city housing, to develop models for an infrastructure incorporating housing with commercial and small cultural uh, facilities, and that is indeed the major purpose of uh, the proposed institute to participate in this particular event to deal with one of the projects as defined by the planning team of this particular endeavor. We see here indeed a contrast between well maintained stock and a rather dilapidated stock. The major task is to rejuvenate these areas and to create new examples of inner city housing. Two words about the organization itself. Uh, the institute itself is planned for the first summer session in cooperation with the planning team of the International Building Exhibit at the Technical University. It is attended that our students will work with a team of students from the Technical University in dealing with one specific project. On top of it, there will be an exploration of the city, opportunities to discover a city uh, and to study not only history of uh, architecture, past, recent, but also take a look into the future. There are some handouts available on site, and I would be happy to talk to whoever wants to about this particular event. Thank you. your attention to the uh, exhibit on courthouses outside. This is a revision of the uh, courthouse exhibit that was done by Professor Hermanson about uh, 10 years ago. The Indiana Arts Commission has given us the 
opportunity and given him the opportunity to upgrade and update that exhibit. It's been seen by, I guess it's been seen by maybe a quarter of a million people by now. It's traveled all over uh, Indiana and adjoining states and uh, it's an exhibit that opened first uh, at the American Institute of Architects in, uh, in Washington. What I would like to do tonight is to show you uh, a little bit of a recent trip that uh, we made to England and through uh, Germany to Denmark. The purpose of the trip was to see the students uh, in action on a polyarch in, uh, in England. When Marvin Rosenman started them, uh, I guess, eight years ago, uh, 1972, and went to stay first with the uh, Marazzis at the hotel in London. Uh, I've tried ever since, every two years that we've sent a group there, I wanted to go and join them, so this time we finally uh, made it. Stayed there about five days and then went uh, on to Denmark, where I had lived in 1960 and visited in 62 and 64 and 72 and had not been back in eight years, so it was an opportunity to go back to visit with some of our former faculty, some of our alumni, and to see what was happening uh, in Denmark. So we have the lights off, or uh, we'll show you some of the things that we saw along the way. Uh, we flew first to Brussels, and then caught a plane over to, uh, to London, uh, stayed one night in London, and went down to uh, Pontypool, Wales, to visit some friends there, uh, joined the students in Bath uh, a day later, uh, two days later, traveled with the students to Oxford. Then we went back to Brussels, traveled uh, through Dusseldorf and Hanover on up uh, by rental car up to uh, Copenhagen, down to visit friends on a little island in Peru, up to Aarhus, and then back down to uh, Brussels at home in uh, 19 days. I would think so. Uh, it's very interesting. You get off the airplane in uh, London, and you uh, can get on the tube and go right into the Russell Square Station uh, in the middle of London in about uh, 45 or 50 minutes. That uh, Russell Square Station is right there. This is Russell Square. That's the St. Margaret's Hotel on uh, Bedford Place. For five different polyarch groups. Uh, Mary Fran and I had a, a room on the third floor and looking out on, to the back on this uh, beautiful uh, garden. When you go out, this is St. Margaret's on the left. You can go out, take a left, and you walk uh, past the back of the British Museum. You go on down to another square, and on the right there, you can see the uh, 8A school. The hotel is beautifully located just a block from the British Museum and about uh, three blocks from the Architectural Association School. It's also near uh, theaters and near the uh, British Design Center where they were having an exhibition of uh, uh, Britain's latest car, the Morris, uh, what's it called, Maxi, Met Met Metro. Maxi Metro, or Metro, I think it is. Uh, at any rate, it's supposed to get 65 miles to the gallon. We had the opportunity after we just spent one night there to, uh, to go out to Wales and be picked up by friends and driven through some very beautiful uh, Welsh countryside that looked like this. And Wales is just, this is just two hours out of uh, London. They live in the country there and they're coming back to live in the uh, country uh, in Muncie, Indiana, people who are from a corporation here in town. This is, a, they bought an old uh, mill house there, and uh, the barn is uh, out of stone, and the stucco building is their home. And the little town of Pontypool has a, has a nice main street. Uh, after you go through this fortified uh, bridge here, get to a main street that uh, is a very beautiful one and a uh, working street. The next day, uh, our friends took us to 
meet the students in, uh, in Bath. And this is the, uh, the circus at Bath with those beautiful old trees in the middle of the circus. I knew about the Crescent, but uh, I didn't recall that there was a circus there. This is at the edge of the Crescent, looking back toward the, uh, toward the circus down this street. And then uh, in these following shots, you can see kind of a panorama standing in that one spot and looking out over the countryside from the crescent. The crescent begins here on the right. All houses still lived in today. And on the corner here is a house that, is, uh, that it serves as a, uh, as a museum. One of the days in London, I spent going out to visit Professor Hermanson, who was in the hospital, uh, had he uh, suffered a heart attack while we were there. And uh, so I was able to go out and visit him in the town of Peterborough. Uh, not a very uh, lovely place, but a place that was very kind to him along the way. One of the days, uh, we got on a super, uh, super bus. Uh, the fanciest that I've been, ever been on, and uh, went out uh, to spend the day first at Uxbridge. Uh, uh, if you'll remember from our guest lecture, either last year or the year before, uh, we had a, uh, a lecture on Uxbridge, which is the town hall here built around an old civic uh, building on the right here, an old Georgian uh, building. and. Uh, uh, with fragments of the buildings that were on the site before, if not the actual buildings themselves. It was a town hall, civic center, uh, athletic uh, complex. On from Uxbridge out to, to Blenheim Castle, Blenheim Palace. And in the gardens at Blenheim Palace, this is the private uh, side of the garden where the, uh, uh, the owner of the palace uh, lived with the topiary uh, bushes here. On the other side is, uh, is a whole set of uh, fountains and a beautiful uh, uh, view down to a lake. We went on to Oxford, and one of the things that I especially wanted to see in Oxford was St. Catherine's College by the Danish architect Arne Jakobsen. It had been very, the photographs I had seen of, the, of it uh, were all done with brand new and great, with a very harsh look to it. Now that the landscaping has grown up uh, it, and matured, it, it is much softer. It has a patina of, uh, of use, a patina of uh, wear from the climate. The, uh, Arne Jakobsen is very interested in landscape. He did, he designed his own uh, landscaping, and it's probably one of the most sensitive aspects of his, uh, of his architecture. This is uh, uh, was a rather wet day. The rain that had been threatening all day finally arrived when we got out to this uh, to this college and. Farthest from our bus station, I remember that day. Many of the details of the landscape, such as this, such as the sensitivity of the parking lot here, where you uh, have some grass growing in between, and uh, you don't have paving and the yellow line painted, is indicative of the sensitivity of the whole design. The uh, two days later, we flew out of London up a car in Brussels and started driving north. Uh, one of the uh, places we stopped along the way is this uh, is uh, here in uh, Germany, one of the old uh, Hanseatic uh, League uh, uh, cities here. This is the, the uh, city that is very famous for, uh, for Marzipan. Marzipan shop, we found it right through the uh, city hall uh, arches there on the, uh, on the right. We visited Hanover on the, on the way between Denmark and, uh, and Brussels. And in this case, we, uh, the building here is the, the downtown center in Hanover designed by our former visiting faculty. In fact, he was the first visiting faculty to the college, Eckhard Bowman. He and his wife, 
bed was up on a balcony, and the then uh, sofa and chairs and uh, dressing area down below. I was able to get by uh, Hans Sporov's office. Hans was uh, uh, a Danish architect who was with us in 1972. He and Walter Netsch were teaching in the same studio at the same time. And these are some posters uh, that are part of a whole series, of, uh, an explanatory series of posters to show uh, what the effects of zoning are and to explain zoning to Danish townspeople. So it's very, uh, these are the biggest posters and we'll get, we're getting in the mail the whole set, so we'll have an exhibit of this uh, uh, within a couple months. These, but it was interesting, we thought that the, uh, his firm was hired by the uh, Danish uh, federal government to, uh, to explain uh, planning uh, to people in zoning. We didn't get to see Hans Gora, but I talked to him on the telephone, and by the time uh, we had gone to Aarhus, uh, he was back in Copenhagen. But while we were in Copenhagen, he was in Korea, and from Korea, he went to Alaska, where he's planning the whole uh, coastline planning for, uh, for Alaska, uh, paid for by the uh, North Slope Oil Company. We also had a tough time. We did get to see uh, Canoe Priest when we got to Aarhus. But Canoe, when we were in, in uh, Denmark, he was first in the Bahamas where he's doing the hotel. Then he went on to Aspen, Colorado, where he's doing the hotel. Then he went to Princeton, where his Scanty Con Educational Center, uh, the second one to be built, uh, opened up in, in May in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. Uh, this is a view, and I'll be part of my photography on this, I hope. But on the left here is the Sailor's uh, Barn. And it's called Newhound, where the canal comes right into the middle of the city. On the right there is the is the Royal Academy in an old uh, uh, palace. If you remember, Tobias Faber, who lectured on Danish architecture and on China to uh, our students uh, last year, uh, I had lunch with him in the faculty dining room here. When I was a student in the academy, I was always down here in what used to be the jail. That's the uh, student canteen uh, there. Now the place has gotten so big that they have two other uh, canteens within the uh, complex. The entrance to the academy is here. The offices of the academy are on the second floor of this white building here. When I was a student there, uh, uh, on Scorum's studio, I was one of his students. His studio was right there where the where Tobias Faber has his office now. And so I was able to sit there next to that window, right on this beautiful Conan's uh, uh, new tour, the King's New Market, and this is the Royal Opera House there. This is inside uh, the courtyard of uh, Shalott Moor. And one of the alleyways with some of the students coming in. This is the uh, the morgue or the uh, archive, the furniture archives for the industrial design department, where they have one of every uh, famous chair that's ever been made. Uh, very nice to have, but those are are just along the corridor next to their studios. And I thought this was a very interesting place. This is the, the student center where you where faculty post their uh, course description and their sign-up sheet where the students uh, come to sign up for courses. At the academy, you don't take a sequence or a series of courses. The courses are offered. You take what you want. After five years, you can... Uh, you can apply for uh, to have uh, uh, your thesis approved, and you can graduate. So it's up to you what courses you take and how well you prepare yourself. But the uh, examinations are fairly uh, fairly stringent. 
So the students come here. There are also uh, several photocopy machines, a couple of bimbo machines. Uh, Ozolate uh, machine was in there. Uh, adjoining this room were several offices where the scholarship, the, the ladies who handle scholarships, uh, have their offices. So this was the place that the students came for all their needs and information. Uh, we also had the opportunity to visit uh, where the house I first lived in uh, 20 years ago over here on the, on the right where 10 students lived in that house. And on the left here, uh, I rented an apartment on the top floor there after three months. This is in the city. This was out in a suburb. And uh, we never had any hot water until October. So I moved into an apartment house. It was very nice to have hot water and to buy an apartment. I bought that apartment for a down payment of $600 and $40 a month. That apartment uh, would now sell, uh, unfortunately I sold it when I left, but it now sells for about $80,000 a one room apartment in the city. We were able to drive out one day to uh, my favorite building uh, anytime, anywhere, the Louisiana Museum by the architects Bowl and Buller, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the best example of indoor, uh, outdoor architecture uh, in the world. Uh, called her sculpture here out uh, uh, next to the water, and if you can see a thin line there, that's, uh, that's Sweden just across the way, a uh, thin line across there. Must be about uh, 20 miles across the suite in there. We had a wonderful uh, a traveling exhibit and a permanent exhibit as well. Uh, one of these days I'll get all my slides together. I must have about two dozen shots of this tree here at all seasons uh, of the year. It's a very, very uh, uh, beautiful place. If you go to Denmark, plan to, to spend more than just an hour or two there. <clears throat> Just a mile down the road from Louisiana, we went to visit some friends who have a little house uh, that's over 100 years old. This one right here with the car park in front. And this is the back side, side of it with their garden there. And this is the view they have, again, looking over toward uh, Sweden. Uh, water was frozen in the, in the ponds in uh, Louisiana, but there were kids out sailing on this water, and in addition, there were people in wetsuits going, uh, going, uh, uh, what do you call it, sailing, windsurfing, windsurfing. And uh, uh, one of these days, I'd like, I've got other uh, shots of this same garden taken eight years ago. I'd like to show those to the landscape architect sometime to show how uh, the owner here has changed his, changed his garden over a period. He's the assistant editor of Architecture magazine and the, archi and the editor of Architect 10 uh, magazine, Christian Enable. We were able to visit uh, old friends here on the left. There's a friend who now heads up uh, the finances and legal affairs of all uh, uh, high school building in, uh, in Denmark. On the right there is a friend, Ross Lytell, who designed this chair here you may have seen that's in the Museum of Modern Art uh, collection. There the couple who live in a little house down on the island of Eru. We also got to see uh, Olaf Lynn, who took us to the highest point in Denmark. It's called Himmlerbjerg, Heaven Mountain, and it's about 750 above sea level. That's the tallest point in, uh, in the country. While we were there, the election was taking place. And you might be interested uh, that uh, most of the days and the public radios were for Carter. And here it says Carter and Reagan in uh, four feet means hair fine, like a hairline finish. Here it says the middle class goes in an uproar and vote Reagan. Here it says USA 
two parties, the Gallup poll there has to, what, take two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen different, uh, different uh, parties. The, the communists at that point weren't doing too well last time. But you can't be fooled by that. There was once, uh, one election when, uh, when I was there that the, the head of the Communist Party changed, he, he left the party, changed the name of the party. He was able to go on television uh, and get equal time because all of these 13 parties get equal time. And he, he was very good at crying. So he cried and he said, my mother hopes you'll vote for me. And he never, he never told the people that he's communist, but he got a lot of votes. He got nine seats in the parliament that year. Along the way, we got to uh, got to see some new architecture, and I thought you might like to see especially uh, this one. This is Jorn Utsan's uh, new church there, and uh, Jorn Utsan is the architect for the Sydney Opera House. Uh, this church uh, has a, is in an industrial area and has rather an industrial look to it, uh, and it's much different uh, once you get inside the building, however. Uh, the theme of these skylights here you'll see in some of uh, the new priest's building, I'll show you in just a, just a moment. Uh, Priest's buildings came first, by the way, with this uh, with this thing. But what what happens is within that industrial framework, there's a very interesting way that he treats the ceiling. You get plenty, you get a special kind of light quality in there. This is the chapel. These are the various entrances that we were looking at. That's the court that we looked into, and you come into the building here. And this way, at least as far as these slides go. So these are corridors leading into the into the church. And what uh, what he was trying for was a very interesting overall uh, light quality. And of course, they're very much influenced by uh, by Alvar Alto's uh, dealing with light as well. Uh, the church is very famous in Denmark, and people are very excited about it. I personally uh, did not find it uh, uh, to be as exciting as the Danes would consider it. I think that for me, the, the uh, screen behind the altar was, was fairly, fairly clumsy, even though it's a, a reasonable uh, design idiom. It was interesting. Uh, someone uh, in looking at the slides, I think it was Professor Fisher, when he saw these slides, remarked that that in the Sydney Opera House, you'll remember that the, that the freeform is the freeform roof, and everything uh, takes place under the freeform roof. In this case, uh, he, he has created a rather boxy structure with the freeform uh, suspended ceiling uh, hanging within that. Uh, we got the chance to go on over then to uh, Orhus and to visit uh, Knut Fries's office. Knut Fries was on our on our faculty in 19, I think it was about 1976, and we hope we can get him uh, uh, back here again. He's he's uh, very luckily one of the busy architects in Denmark. Denmark is the same size as the state of Indiana in terms of population, about 5 million people. Denmark has 3,800 architects. We have 600 architects. They have, however, more, at this point, more than 600 architects unemployed. Still, that means that they have 3,200 3, architects gainly employed designing uh, uh, very high quality environment. Uh, Knut's uh, office is composed of three buildings. A building on the street, a courtyard, another building, another courtyard up the hill, and a third building uh, building behind. So here's this orange building is the, is the street side building. In 
you go through into the second court, which they used to park their cars, you can see that the building was painted in the summertime and that they painted around the, uh, the vines that were growing on the wall. It looked pretty nice uh, as it is, I think. That black building there uh, is also part of their complex. So uh, they've got several different buildings in addition uh, to the courtyard. This is the, the, the upper courtyard. You can see here on the left where everyone eats lunch. This is Canoe's office right here. He was not in town, so we used his desk uh, for coffee. Uh, the office is at one time had about 70 people, including one of our alumni, Julie Monk, uh, worked there for about a year, or maybe it was six months. She did her internship uh, there. And uh, uh, it's now a 40-man 40, 40 office, but, uh, but a busy one. This is, uh, we were able to go on a tour of some of his work one day, and this is some of the earliest work done by their office. These are two houses uh, that were designed uh, back in the early 50s, 1953, I think the date. This is a hotel that he did some time back, Hotel Marseilles. We stayed there. On the right is some high-rise uh, housing that he did back in the 50s. This is a an office building uh, done in, in uh, the late 50s. Uh, in this one, he did his first collaboration with an artist that he uses quite often. This is a very interesting, uh, uh, I'm sorry that that uh, camper was there and I couldn't get a good uh, shot of it, but this is a very interesting way to treat this wall. And it's one of the pa a painting that looks one way in one direction and a different uh, in the other direction. If you, in Canoe's uh, architecture, you'll always find a very fine integration of, uh, of art. This is his Scanty Con Center. It is a commercial continuing education center and hotel where they have all kinds of, uh, of uh, specialized and fancy media. It is this kind of center that is being built right now at Princeton. So that they will, uh, with the New York market, they will have uh, plenty of uh, people to draw on for uh, short courses. He, when he was here in the school teaching, he also designed one for Florida, but that one has never uh, materialized. This is the Hotel White House, and I, he's done about 20 hotels uh, worldwide. This is the Hotel White House in a town called Abletoft. And all of these hotels seem to be uh, have this idea of stepping down the hillside with terraces. These are the rooms on the next floor below, and then the next floor steps out again. So it steps this particular hotel steps down the hillside. You can see the terraces here going on down the hill toward the ocean there. This is the hotel called Hotel Stalbusco, and I show you. Uh, buildings that exist on the site so that you have some feeling for for his uh, use of the landscape and, and nature. It's next to a big, uh, big new bridge that connects uh, the western part of Denmark, Jutland, with uh, uh, the island of Fune. Again, you can see the terraces stepping down the hill. This is his Rosengor, Rose Garden Shopping Center in uh, in Odense, and Christian Anderson's uh, hometown. This is a very new uh, building for the Telephone Society of, uh, of Western uh, Jutland. And they, they not only provide the telephone service uh, in the same way that, that uh, Bell Telephone has a monopoly on telephone service, this telephone company has a monopoly. It is a private company, so that the telephone service is not a uh, socialized uh, service in Denmark. They also 
manufacturing this place uh, telephone equipment that is sold worldwide. Please notice the, uh, the corridors, the, which he's treated as streets, and this uh, and the skylighting of these corridors. Danes like to do everything they can to get light into a building. I'm going to. Sh the building is built around courtyards. You can see here on the left that uh, the place is so big people have to get around on bicycles. Uh, I'm going to show you just two of these courtyards because John Russell has photographed every one of them and he'll be giving you a, a better show of those uh, at a later time. This is a school done about the same time, actually done uh, before the uh, factory. It's the Risco uh, uh, Gymnasium School, and it has this uh, it has this same switch here. It utilizes the same uh, same skylight uh, technique as the factory. And uh, indeed, the paths through here are called, uh, called streets. Uh, the man on the right here is uh, Christian Bunda, who is, uh, who is uh, the business manager for Knud Fries' firm, Fries and Volka. Now, the next projects I'm showing you, this particular one here is done by Knud Fries, but the landscape architect is uh, a man named Hansen. And so he had, we met him while we were there. He wants to come here and teach. He, is, uh, he was first at the academy in Copenhagen. He's now just retired from the academy in Aarhus. He's been, been there for 10 years. And he's very interested in coming and uh, teaching at Paul State. Luke Priest is, is his best friend and has uh, set him up for us. Also, he set up uh, Johann Richter, uh, who has been practicing uh, the same time as uh, Luke Priest, their best friend. Luke Priest's son works for Johann Richter's uh, firm. Very beautiful landscape here. This is a city hall in a little town outside uh, Copenhagen, outside Orbis. You can see that autumn was uh, was behind us here. We we got to Europe and found leaves uh, still on the trees, and still color. Please notice the use of sculpture in the landscape. Please note the uh, excellence of the landscape detail. You pay, uh, pay your utilities bills here and do all the kinds of things that you do at a city hall or courthouse in Europe. I'm sorry. Uh, Better shot of this wonderful tapestry on the wall here. There's a tapestry here and also a ceramic sculpture in the middle of the uh, floor outside the uh, major uh, conference room of the building. Now, the same landscape architect landscaped these next two buildings you'll see, although they have different architects. Uh, this is the, the architect for this building is C.F. Ruler, the fine old uh, architectural firm uh, who designed the Aarhus uh, University, a very famous group of buildings. This is the new television uh, center for Jutland uh, with the wall here very specially designed to deflect noise away from the television and radio production studios. In the distance here in this shot, you see the new journalism high school which is right across the street. For them, a journalism high school would have radio and television journalism, uh, written uh, journalism, and photo journalism. Sven Hansen was the landscape architect for this, uh, for this building, and Richter, who would like to come here and teach, was the architect for the, uh, for the building. Journalism High School. It's the only journalism high school in Denmark. Please notice again the use of the sculpture 
shot with this was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the sun sets at 3 in uh, November in uh, Denmark. A very, it's a very interesting building. It steps up uh, up the side of the hill. This is Sven Hansen's own home. He was able to uh, purchase the home in which the Landscape Society of Denmark was founded. We had a founding meeting some 60 years ago in this, in this home here. And uh, he was able to purchase the home and the garden. Of course, he reworked all of the, all of the gardens. These, this garden sits down below uh, the new creases. Hansen. Here, as you will see, this is beautiful rolling. 